We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. For tens of thousands of years, civilizations have looked up and dreamt of being able to journey to the stars, and this golden era in the 1960s was that moment when that ancient dream finally became a reality. Gemini and Mercury Remastered is about the very dawn of human space exploration. They are such important missions, we often don't hear about them, particularly Project Gemini, but these are the first time we humans left Earth. It was also the first time we could look back at Earth from space, look back at ourselves. In fact, the opening quote in the book is from Socrates, who as far back as 400 BC said, man must rise above the Earth to the top of the atmosphere and beyond, because only then can he appreciate the world in which he lives. We will become eventually a multi-planetary species, but this is where it all began. Gagarin, April 12th, 1961, became the first in space. Three weeks later, uh, Alan Shepard made his journey, although it was only a suborbital hop straight up and back down, a 15 minute space ride, if you like. And yet within three weeks of that very first mission, President Kennedy made this quite astonishing commitment to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. So it was really then Project Gemini that was responsible for proving that that was even possible. A lot of people sadly think we went to the moon, simply designed Apollo 11 and Neil Armstrong went and walked on the moon and that was it. But it was an incredibly fast moving project. So they conducted uh, 10 flights in, in 20 months to test all of these techniques because they were in a race, they were in a race with the Soviets. To go from the very first glimpse of the curvature of Earth on Alan Shepard's mission to then walking on the moon within what was just over eight years I mean, you can't plan a bus station in the UK in eight years. You know, it's an extraordinary pace of development. And a lot of people ask, why haven't we done that since? And there's never been a political situation so that you could give someone, which they did on some of these missions, a 50-50 chance of coming home. They were watching these rockets explode and then, you know, the Mercury 7 worked out that at least one of them probably wouldn't come home. Thankfully, they all did, but they almost didn't. So they took some extraordinary risks because this was a race with the Soviets. Not only is these important moments in space like history, not only did they take some of the finest photographs of Earth ever captured on film, the human drama that unfolded because of that risk, because they were pushing the boundaries, is a story that I really want to tell alongside this stunning imagery. They really took the photographs for, they were simply recording their activities for technical assessment but they inherently captured images that transcend documentation. They were able to see detail they've never been able to see before and they realised that they were of use for topographical study, for geological study, oceanography, meteorology, which of course is how we use space imagery now with satellites. But this was where it all started. The original film had been locked away for in this frozen vault in Houston before it was moved to National Archives for decades and when you're using analogue using a copy of that film is is probably okay now that we've got the digital technology to scan and scan at a very high bit depth we can actually now pull out much more detail that actually we probably couldn't even have done in the analogue days so some of the images I've been able to reveal something from probably never even been seen back in the day, but we now have the technology to be able to do that as vividly but as faithfully as possible. There are two types of film and two different processes really that, that I apply. So the still photographs, the benefit there is to use the original. This is a 35 millimeter film taken on board Gemini 4. So this is an example of, of how underexposed some of these images are 
making high resolution digital scans of that film means we can then apply digital processing to actually look what's in those shadows. So what I will do is start to look and start to do some simple kind of stretching of the contrast to start to look at is there anything actually of interest in this frame and we can very quickly start to see that actually yes there is. So this is Ed White so he's just performed the first US spacewalk so a very historic moment and we can see actually this is going to be a really atmospheric shot but having done this initial test we then need to work on it in order to produce a final image that's worthy of being presented or printed and so we end up with the final version this is actually a panorama of, of two photographs to get this full shot we see a star map above his head and actually this is an image that ended up on the front cover of the book and it's just such an atmospheric shot it feels kind of deeply personal we're right there in the spacecraft with him staring out of the window into the heavens he's just achieved something unimaginable so that's a key to the still photography the other source of film that it took was 16 millimeter movie film small format inherently very noisy and what i do with that is apply quite an unusual stacking technique to that it's something that's used in astrophotography where we separate that out into the separate frames stack them on top of each other if you can perfectly align the signal which is the image which we want you can effectively strengthen that signal but you don't strengthen the noise because the noise is in a random place on every frame so by separating separate frames consolidating them again we can pull out detail that we've we've never been able to see before it's an incredibly powerful process here's some 16 mil film the digital scans of it this is alan shepherd on mr3 waiting to launch so i will pick out scenes a start and a finish and then i will split that out digitally into the separate individual flame frames each frame is then a separate image i can then go through these individually i can pick out any that they've got more digital noise it may be dust and debris sometimes it goes a little bit out of focus so i'll, I'll select out the best frames and they're the images then that I use and I apply this stacking technique to. And so this is the end product. Here is Alan Shepard. This is actually the first photograph in the book as he's waiting in his tiny Mercury capsule to become the first American in space. Mercury Gemini took not only some of the first photographs ever taken of Earth, some of the finest photographs of Earth captured on film. It was lucky enough to have input from some of the very early astronauts, um, so that input was absolutely vital. With digital processing, you can push processing a bit too hard, potentially, because it's so powerful, but the, the view in space and on the moon is very stark. There's no atmosphere, so when you look into the distance, there's no haze, so they're incredibly sharp. The light hasn't been filtered through the atmosphere, so you have this incredibly bright white sunlight the black is an incredible depth of black that apparently we earthlings can't even comprehend. They asked Charlie Duke about this and he said it's almost like it's got a like a black velvet, like a texture you could almost touch. And I think when you see these images you can really appreciate what he means to see the beauty of Earth and space. One of the reasons that the photographs of Earth taken during Gemini are so stunning, as well as using incredible equipment, is they flew to altitudes way beyond anything we've, that we've flown since. The International Space Station, for example, orbits uh, at around 200, 250 miles from Earth. Gemini 11 reached 850 miles. Um, so they held the record, actually, the, the Earth orbit altitude record for 58 years. That was broken only last year by the Polaris Dawn mission. There's a shot in the book. It's actually a panorama of two photographs when they were very close to apogee or the highest point. We can see this huge sweeping scale of Earth that was taken over Australia. But it's really the human side to these missions that I find have an emotional depth as well as the aesthetic quality. Some of them look like they could have been from a, a sci-fi movie, but this is real life in the early 1960s. And when you're looking at a photograph of Earth, there's no real reference to say what year you are in. And I think it's so useful to put this era into perspective. So at the start of, of the book and at the end of the book, we have photographs, these black and white shots, pre-mission photographs, the post-mission photographs so we can see the people you know we, we read about them during the book we see these incredible images and it's just a reminder this was the very dawn of human space exploration 
and it's a reminder of what these men were doing. For example, on John Glenn's mission, first American in orbit, he's close to re-entry and he's been informed that there's an indicator light on the ground that suggests his heat shield may have come loose. Now, if that's true, he may well burn up in the atmosphere. By doing the research, looking at the time-stamped mission transcripts, all kinds of clues I can find in the film, mapping that to the frame rates. There's also a clock above his shoulder. I've been able to work out exactly when he's re-entering the atmosphere and been able to produce this image of him in some quite stunning detail. You can see a bit of orange glow uh, in the capsule and he's just there holding steadfast as this 3000 degree heat inches from his back, not knowing if you know, he's about to burn up in the atmosphere. And that's just a portrait of courage and of what these guys were achieving back in the, in the early 1960s. But to be able to pull these kind of images from the shadows to reveal such historic moments, um, they're the ones that really hit home for me.